You are listening to Spell Stoppers, narrated to you by audiobooks with Keeper of Law Stories. Chapter 13 Kit! yelled Max as he ran towards the edge of the rocks, his feet slipping on the slimy algae, Hit's head pounding from the mist that still swirled around him clouding his vision and making everything look green and strange. He peered over the edge, straining his eyes to see. There, on the rocks below, just above the level of the waves, was Kit. She was moving, but he couldn't make out if she was hurt or not. He began to scramble down to join her, but as his head was still spinning, he lost his grip and half slid, Hop fell down the steep rocks and landed heavily beside her. Are you okay? asked Kit, staggering over to him. She had grazed the side of her face and one of her hands, but otherwise seemed unhurt. Yes, replied Max, his head clearing at once now that they were below the level of the mist. He scrambled to his feet and stared at her. It was you! I was worried about you. You fell straight over the edge. It wasn't that bad, she replied. I grabbed hold of a rock going down. That broke my fall. And my backpack gave me a soft landing. I knew it was a good idea to bring a blanket. Ahoy there, came a voice. And they saw the captain and Tom heading towards them in the little rowing boat. Tom was rowing stoically while the captain perched in the bow. Hold on, called the captain. We are coming over. The boat plopped closer, then bumped against the side of the rocks. Kid and Max clambered aboard the boat, lurched violently. Is there another way in? asked Max at once. He was very aware that their rescue mission was not going to plan and kept anxiously scanning the sky in case the owls returned. Let's row around the other side. We might spot something. He stood up to get a better look at the castle, craning his head to look up at the steep dark walls. They are high above him. A face was peering out of one of the robo windows. It was so far away that Max could not quite make out the features properly. But Max saw that there was something very familiar about the mask of grizzled gray hair and thick bushy eyebrows. Bram! he yelled, almost toppling overboard. Bram! Max! cried Bram. His hoarse voice was scurrying on the breeze. Kit! Max! We have come to rescue you! shouted. How do we get in? We can't find a door. But Bram was waving his arms frantically, signaling them to turn back. The keepers are coming, he bellowed and pointed at the horizon. Get away from here. Go back to the shore. Quick! Max turned and saw that there was a mass of owls flying out of the woods, silhouetted against the breaking dawn. Isn't there some way in? yelled desperately. We can't leave you in there. There's no other way. Bram shouted at the top of his voice. Just go or they will kill you. Max sat back down, stunned by their bad luck. Kit, meanwhile, was frowning at Tom and the captain. What's the matter with the boat? She asked urgently. Ah, said the captain uncomfortably. The thing is, we seem to have a bit of a problem. He gestured towards Tom, who had spread his anorak over part of the bottom. He was scooping up water with a tin bucket and emptying it over the side. The repair wasn't quite as watertight as we had hoped, admitted the captain, looking rather guilty. Max's heart sank even further as he realized that water was seeping in through the bottom of the boat. Kit scrambled forwards to where Tom was sitting, lifted up the corner of the anorak and examined the hole. That whole repair is coming loose, she said in a hollow voice. The water is getting everywhere. We'll row back quickly, said the captain, sounding panicked. It will be fine. 
Uh, perhaps you two could take over from Tom with plugging the hole and bailing us out. What are you waiting for? Bellowed Bram from high above them. They're coming for you. Tom started to row frantically. Max grabbed the bucket and started scooping up the water that was now beginning to slosh around his ankles. It's not working, said Kit in frustration. Pressing the anorak over the hole on the boat, her teeth gritted as the water kept surging in. It's waterproof, isn't it? bellowed the captain, losing his composure at last. Just keep it over the hole. It's better than nothing. Kit made a face but continued to hold back the sea with Tom's amorak while Max continued bailing. The boat was out of the channel now and was heading away from the rocks back around the side of the castle. The lobster crawled out from beneath the seat at the back of the boat, clicking its claws. Kit quickly seized it and dropped it over the side, but Tom wasn't looking. Then there was a loud cry and a shadow lifted from the boat. Max glanced up then ducked as an owl flew at his head. Its claws outstretched. The whole sky suddenly seemed to be full of them as they gathered above the boat like a dark cloud. Another one sweeped down and this time Max felt its talon graze its shoulders. He yelled and hit as hard as he could with the bucket. It shot off screeching then rejoined the mass of owls that continued to hover above them. The situation was getting worse by the second. The sea was now almost halfway up the inside of the boat. Tom was still grimly rowing at full speed, but because of the weight of the water, they were going slower and slower. It's going to sink, said Kit, abandoning the anorak and trying to scoop out armfuls of water instead. We are not going to get to the shore in time. Two more owls dive bombed them, and once again Max backed them away. Maybe we should swim, he said, not taking his eyes off the cowls for a moment. We might take the keepers off. The boat's going down anyway. But there's all sorts of creatures down there, said the captain in horror. What about the mugfish? Mugfish? Max frowned impatiently. They look like really big goldfish, but they feed on humans, said Kit. The minute we are in there, they'll smell us. But the owls will get us before the mugfish do. Being in the sea will just make it easier for them to pick us off. She spoke in a very matter-of-fact voice, but her lip trembled. For once, even Kit seemed at a loss, but Max had an idea. What if we flip the boat over? He asked, as right at another attacking owl. Once it's upside down, it should float. It won't matter if there's a hole in bottom. We can swim am along underneath it. We can even hang on to the seats to stay soft. Uh, that way, it will be harder for the owls to get at us. And if we are quick, we might back on dry land before the fish find us. Of course, said Kit, her face clearing. I can't believe I didn't think of that. She sprang into the action at once, stowing her backpack into the space where the lobster had been, then tossing the oars overboard out of the way so that they bobbed along on the river waves. Then she came over to see Max join the boat and started to lean to one side. Tom shifted his weight across too and the boat gave another violent heave. It was completely unbalanced now and even more water sloshed in. Two shrieking owls flew at them and they all ducked quickly. What about me? protested the captain who was eyeing the water in horror and clutching at the edge of the tilting boat. What am I supposed to do? Swim, said Kit. I'm a sailor, cried the captain. Sailors don't learn how to swim. It's unlucky. Just hold on to the side and it won't matter if you can swim or not, retorted Max who was losing his patience with the captain. Besides, it's not like you're going to drown. You are a ghost, remember? Tom put an end to the debate by rocking the boat violently, just as the entire flock of birds flew at them in one angry mass of feathers. Their claws outstretched and sharp. The boat tipped over with a dramatic lurch, and Max held his breath as they all sank down under the water. The cold sea hit him like a blow, and straight afterwards there was a loud splash as the upturned boat hit the waves. 
Max rose to the surface gasping and ducked underneath it. He was only just in time. The owl screeched and dived at him and he heard the brakes drum against the rowing boats. Wooden boats. You made it, exclaimed Kit, who was already holding on to the plank seat at, as if it was a float. He joined her, hardly able to see in the dim light that trickled in through the hole in the boat's hull. There was a thud and something landed on the top of the boat. Max heard a clacking, scraping noise, the sound of claws on wood, then a pair of yellow eyes peered through the hole. Kit sank down into the water so only her face was visible, and Max did the same, feeling the salt water stinging his eyes and seeping up his nose. The owl clawed at the splintered edges of the hole, but was too large to fit through. It started pecking at the hole with its beak, then to Max's horror, more owls joined in. Bits of wood started to shower down on them as the mass of owls slowly began to tear the boat apart. Then a loud bang came from the direction of the castle. At once there was a hurry flurry of wings and all the birds flew off. Max and Kit bobbed up again, resting their arms on the seat. I bet that was Bram, gasped Kit. He must have seen us go down and caused a diversion. The relief Max felt at the keeper's departure evaporated when he imagined how Leandra might punish his grandfather for trying to help them. Where are the others? asked Kit, breaking into thoughts. Do you think they made it? Just then the captain surfaced with much spluttering, supported by a Tom. Max noticed that Tom's hands, which had always been quite frog-like, had grown even bigger and were now fully webbed. He also had gills and looked more like a fish than ever. Tom shoved the captain, who was burbling unhappily, onto the small ledge next to Kit's backpack. Then he seized the stern of the rowing boat and began to swim strongly, pushing it along, while staying underwater. The boat started to glide forwards surprisingly fast and Max and Kit swam side by side, holding on to the wooden bench. But just then Max began to think they were out of danger. He felt something tugging at his legs. He twisted away, then Kit gave a yell too. They found us, she cried, and gave a huge kick. Told you, muttered the captain from his corner, as he wedged himself more tightly into the tiny space between the upturned sea and the boat scuffed her, compressing himself in a way that no living person could. Something seized Max's anchor and held onto it firmly. He was pulling down under the water and saw that a huge orange fish was attached to his foot. It took all of Max's strength to force its jaw open and wrench himself free. His shoe was in tatters, the fish's mouth was rubbery and toothless, but Max could see spiraling rows of sharp teeth running through the way down its throat. It wasn't alone either. Half a dozen other fish were miling about the boat, each of them looking very hungry. Tom goggled at Max in alarm and kicked even harder with the webbed feet, sending the boat shooting forwards. Max only just managed to grab hold of the seat again, but he could see the fish making grabs at him. My backpack, yelled Kit, splashing over towards the captain, who pushed it towards her. He tried picking it up, but his hand slipped right through it. Sorry, he said in apologetic tones. I get fainter when I'm nervous. Kit ripped open the zip, rummaged about, and pulled out in the tin of dog food. She yanked on the ring pull and peeled back the lid with trembling hands, then shook the entire contents of the tin into the water. At once there was a flurry of glimmering orange as the whole shoal of mugfish shot after the meat, swimming down into the watery depths. There's only one thing that mugfish prefer to humans, and that's dog food said Kit, as the other stared at her. How on earth did you know that, said Max faintly. Dad, she said simply, he spends half of his life in the sea, remember? Well, thank you, Joey. You are so resourceful, young Kit, cried the captain in cheerful tones. Onwards, Tom. Tom propelled the boat along faster than ever until it finally reached the shallows and bumped against the seabed. They emerged from underneath the boat, 
blinking at being out in the daylight. Somehow they managed to haul the rowing boat up to the shore, then all four of them collapsed onto the sand. Max felt his initial relief at being back on dry land ebb away, as he remembered and Bram was not only still in the castle, but was probably now in even worse situation thanks to their rescue attempt. He did not know what sort of diversion Bram had created, but it must have put him in great danger. Despair washed over Max. He had no idea what to do now. He wished that he had learned how to spell stop, at least that would have given him some sort of magical ability. Instead, he felt completely powerless. Visions of what might ha be happening to Bram kept flickering through his mind like some horrible film. Max got to his feet, soaked to the skin and exhausted. He knew he needed another plan and soon. The problem was he had absolutely no clue what the plan should be. Chapter 14 We need to get off the beach, said Kit, who was surveying the horizon with a frown. It's too dangerous. The keepers might come after us again. Max followed her gaze and saw the owls were still flitting about the castle turrets, above the mist that looked even thicker and greener than before. He knew that Kit was right. They were asking for trouble being out in the open, in full view of the castle. Bram would not be able to distract the owls forever. Let's go back to my house, suggested Kit, slinging her sodden backpack over her shoulders. She turned to the others. You can come too if you like. Best be off, said Tom, shaking his head and looking embarrassed, and he sank down into the sand. I'll have to decline too, said the captain. Cassandra will be waiting for me. Out of all of them, the captain looked the most bedraggled. His wig was askew, one of his lace sleeves was torn, and you could see right through him. Max had no idea how Ghost responded to stress, but the captain certainly seemed to be suffering. Will you be all right? he asked. I'll be fit as a fiddle, don't you worry, said the captain. I just need a bit of a rest, my sea legs aren't what they used to be. He raised a hand in a farewell salute and drifted off in the direction of his house. So what do we do now? asked Kit, as she and Max hurried towards the village. Try again, said Max, trying to sound more confident than he felt. But how? asked Kit, frowning. You heard Bram, he said there wasn't any other way in. Max fell silent. He did not have an answer, and the more he thought about it, the more impossible it seemed. They were heading up the main street now, something looked different. But Max could not quite figure out what it was. Then Kit nudged him and pointed to what had once been the boarded up shop front that concealed Pearl's bakery. The cafe, breathed Kit. She's actually opened it. The old dilapidated building that stood next to Pearl's shop had been completely transformed. The outside of it had been painted a cheery lemon yellow and the windows had been cleaned until they sparkled. Inside lines of colorful bunting framed a rainbow display of glass cake stands that were piled high with cakes and pastries. Behind it were stables of people eating and laughing. Pearl appeared at the window, waved, then rushed over and threw open the door. What happened to you both? she cried. You are soaked to the skin. We went skimming, said Kit evasively. And your clothes? asked Pearl, looking bemused. Why don't you come inside and dry off? What made you open the cafe? asked Max, as she assured them inside. Well, everyone's been talking about what happened to Bram. It made me think how dreadful it's become living here. So I decided to open the cafe. Someone needs to stand up to Leandra. And I thought that if I did something, perhaps it might encourage other people to stand up to her too. As Max looked around the cafe, he realized he had never seen so many of the villagers in one place before. Almost all of the little round tables were occupied. A delicious scent of freshly baked cakes wafted through the air, and there was a happy hum of voices and the clink of cutlery on china, which died away rather abruptly as Max and Kit arrived. Everyone seemed to be staring at them. I can fix that if you like, said Pearl, and Max realized that he and Kit were dripping sea water all over the sandy floor. She whispered something under her breath and waved her hands about in a funny circular motion. Max felt his clothes dry at once. It was the strangest feeling, as if the water had just evaporated. Thanks, he said in surprise. 
It will wear off as soon as you leave, I'm afraid, said Pearl, sounding apologetic. But at least it means you can stay for something to eat. We should really go, began Max, who felt like the most important thing was to rescue Bram. But Kit interrupted him. We'd love to, she said brightly, and then turned to Max. We might as well, said she in a low voice. We need to figure out what to do next. Pearl showed them to a table and hurried off, returning with a tray laden with lemonade, ginger beer, and a staggering selection of pastries and cakes. Max recognized the ones shaped like scallop shells and sea urchins, but there were others he hadn't seen before. Those are chocolate conches, and these ones are seashore surprises, announced Pearl, pointing them out as she placed everything on the table. I've got to see to other customers, but call me if you want anything else. She left, and Max took a bite out of a seashore surprise, a lemon-colored ice cake that was shaped rather like a small crab. He chewed thoughtfully, so absorbed with trying to come up with a plan that he barely noticed when his seashore surprise wriggled out of his hand and hid behind his lemonade bottle. The only thing I can think of is learning how to spell stop, he said. Bram wanted me to, after all, maybe it could help in some way. Kit was clasping a ginger beer and looking equally preoccupied. Being able to spell stop didn't keep Bram from being taken though, she said. And he looked pretty trapped when we saw him in the castle, didn't he? Annoying though it was, Max had to admit that Kit had a point. But he still felt as if it was something he had to do, instead of replying. He tried to recapture his seashore surprise. It let out a high-pitched squeak and jumped off the table, scurried across the floor, and hid underneath the counter. Max abandoned any hope of retrieving the runaway cake and turned back to Kit. What if we ask the police and the people in here if they know of any way into the castle, he asked. We can't, Kit looked scandalized. Everyone in yelling terrified of Leandra. You can't just come out with something like that. You have got to be careful about who you speak to. But Max was already getting to his feet. It had to be worth a try. Hello? He called as loudly as he could. The whole cafe fell silent once more as everybody turned to stare at him. I need your help, he began. My grandfather has been taken by the keepers. He's trapped in the castle. Does anyone know how I could reach him? Is there any way in? A man covered in silvery scales choked on his coffee. An elderly woman with long greenish hair that looked like seaweed had a fork full of cake, suspended in mid-air as if she was too surprised to put it in her mouth. A stout man with a long black beard and a lumpy fisherman's jersey that reached to his knees opened his mouth then shut it again. However, nobody said a word. We have got to stand up to Leandra, Max cried. Pearl's been brave. She's opened the cafe and you all came. Bram will die if Leandra makes him fix the castle again. I just need to find a way in so I can get him out of there. He looked around the room expectantly. He caught sight of Omar, the ice cream seller, who was sitting in a corner with a look of sympathy upon his face. I'm sorry about your grandfather, said Omar, and there was a shuffling noise as the rest of the customers swiveled around to stare at him. We all think well of him. It's a shame he has been taken. There was some nodding and murmuring. I'm sure if any of us knew anything, we'd find a way to tell you, he continued, looking around to the rest of the customers. There was even more shuffling and murmuring, but no one else spoke up, and the atmosphere became increasingly awkward. Pearl came over to Max, her face alight with concern. I wish I could help, she said, but as far as I know, only the keepers can get into the castle. Max sat back down, feeling foolish. Kit had an I told you so expression on her face. Let's go, he muttered, wanting to get out of the cafe as quickly as possible. So what do we do now, said Kit, as soon as they were outside. I need to let my parents know I am okay. They will be wondering where I am. I just slipped out earlier without telling them. I'm going back to Bams, said Max. I want to have another go at spell stopping. At least I will be doing something. Come over if you get lonely, said Kit. We can try thinking another plan. Max nodded absent-mindedly. He still thought that him learning how to spell star was their best hope at present. It seemed unlikely that they would come up with a better idea without any new information. They gave and said goodbye and went their separate ways, Kit down a side street towards her own home, and Max back along the main street heading for the road that went in the direction of the farmhouse. 
Before he had gone twenty meters from Pearl's cafe, he suddenly felt a horrible drenching sensation. The drying charm that Pearl had cast had worn off, and his clothes had returned to their former sodden state. Sea water dripped down his back and puddled in his shoes. He squelched down the street, trying not to feel discouraged. But things didn't get better once he'd got home. Max spent the entire afternoon trying and failing to learn how to spell stop, until he finally collapsed into bed, utterly exhausted, but not one bit closer to rescuing Bram. Chapter Fifteen. The castle was getting worse when Max woke up the next morning and looked out of his window. He saw that the green mist was curling like huge vaporous snakes around the castle walls, spreading out across the surrounding water. Dark clouds were gathering above the mass of spiky turrets, and the whole building looked as if it was shuddering very slightly, which gave it an oddly blurry look. Max did not know what this meant, but it could not be good. Then he caught sight of something else. A plume of black smoke was rising up into the still morning air. It was coming from the village. Max leaned right out the window, trying to see what it was, but all he could see were the distant roofs and chimney pots. There was a skidding, crunching noise as Kit appeared on her red bike. She sped through the gates and braked violently. "Paul's cafe is burned down!" she cried, catching sight of him as she got off her bike. Max shot downstairs at once. Kit was already in the kitchen, surrounded by the dogs. "What happened?" he asked, even though a part of him already knew the answer. Leandra appeared a couple of hours after we left," said Kit, who was holding, looking shaken. She took one look at the cafe and set fire to it. "Is Pearl hurt? What about the customers? Was there anyone in there?" "She is not hurt, just really upset. The owls chased everyone else away." "Didn't she try to defend herself?" asked Max. She is a sand witch, after all. There is no way her charms could have been any defense against Leandra," said Kit. "They are nowhere near strong enough. It's a completely different sort of magic." But Max, the cafe is ruined, and so is her shop. It's horrible. We helped her put out the fire last night, and everything's all charred and burned. Do you think it was something to do with what I said?" asked Max, sinking back to his impromptu speech the day before about standing up to the keeper. What if Leandra heard about it? I don't know," said Kit, looking troubled. "She seems to know about everything that happens in the village. I keep telling you, that's why everyone's always hiding away. I can't believe Paul was brave enough to make a stand. Maybe we should go over now, see if there's anything we can do to help." Paul's already left the village," said Kit. She was too scared to stay in yelling any longer. She's gone. Max could hardly believe it. But I thought she had to live near the sea, and her home's here. She said she was going to stay with some relatives in Cornwall. To be honest, I'm not sure if she's coming back. A blazing knot of anger was beginning to flare up in Max. In the space of 24 hours, Leandra had taken his grandfather and driven one of the nicest people he had ever met out of the village. At that moment, a blue sports car rolled into the farmyard, and the dogs started barking. <laughs> said Kit, trying to calm them. A Max. Went out over the door. A man with long grey locks climbed out of the car. "I've come for my painting," he said. "Is Mr. Harrow here?" "No, he's not," said Max shortly. "But he said I could come and pick it up first thing this morning." Max wished that the man would just go away. There were more important things to worry about. Kit appeared in the doorway, clinging onto Banana and Sardine, who were still barking by their collars. Trago was sitting beside Bram's chair, as if expecting him to return at any moment. I think the painting's been mended," she said. "It's in the workshop just beside the door." "I'll get it," said Max impatiently. The man was gazing at him with a confused expression on his face, and Max suddenly became aware that he was still in his stripy pajamas. He had been so distracted by Kit's news that he had completely forgotten he was wearing them. He spotted the painting as soon as he set foot in the workshop. It was the portrait of the Victorian gentleman. Bram had carefully rebalanced it so it now made anyone who looked at it feel pleasantly calm rather than completely hypnotized. Max avoided making eye contact with it. He did not want to feel calm. He just wanted to find a way to get to Bram. "Lovely," said the man gazing at it, then breaking into a smile. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a handful of notes. "We had settled on 400," he said, holding them out to Max. "Oh," said Max in surprise. Right. Eh, uh, thanks. 
He took the cash and thrust the painting into the man's hands. Goodbye then, he said, and held the workshop door open. But the man did not go away. He was still hovering there, as he was expecting something. Er, uh, do you want anything else? A receipt, of course. Max had no idea what a spell-stopping receipt looked like. He had certainly never seen Bram write one. Most of the customers just seemed glad that their precious antiques were no longer trying to kill them. He grabbed a spare bit of paper and wrote Euro 500, 400 for fixing painting. Thank you on it. Then as an afterthought, he signed his name, making it extra squiggly. There you go, he said, handing it to the man, praying silently that he would finally go away. The man looked at it for a moment. It seemed like he was going to insist on something else, but then he just thanked Max, put the painting in his car and drove off, much to Max's relief. As soon as he had vanished up the lane, Kit came over to Max. How did this spell stopping go? She asked. Not good. I spent all of yesterday afternoon trying, but I still can't do it. Maybe you were tired, suggested Kit. After everything that happened at the castle, why not try again now? All right, said Max. He glanced over to the long workbench where the stubbed weasel was sitting. Clicking its sharp pointed teeth, he sighed. He took a deep breath and tried to empty his mind, then went over and seized it. A violent surge of magic crackled through him. Max reeled backwards. It felt as if someone had punched him in the chest. I don't get what I'm doing wrong, he said angrily. Once he'd got his breath back, I'm doing exactly what Bram said. The thing is, Max, said Kit hesitantly, don't take this the wrong way, but you don't look like your mind's clear at all. Every time you try, you're frowning. I'm not. You are. You're doing it right now. It's as if you are worried that something bad is going to happen. Well, it is, cried Max. Bad things happen to me all the time. Either I get bitten or electrocuted or I break something or I kill it. I might as well expect the worst because it's going to happen anyway. Or maybe it keeps happening because you are expecting it to. That's so stupid, said Max. I'm being realistic. You're being really annoying, said Kit, sounding thoroughly exasperated. They both glared at each other on the brink of having an argument. Then the dog started barking again. It's probably another customer, said Kit curtly. And she stalked out of the workshop, slamming the door behind her. Max scowled after her, feeling like he wanted to kick something. Then his irritation slowly began to subside, and he found himself thinking about what Kit had said. Maybe his mind hadn't been that clear after all. He stared fixedly at a point on the wall and tried not to think of anything. He scrunched his face up and then relaxed it. He took a deep breath in and let it go. At first, he th his thoughts kept jumbling around his mind, but he refused to listen to them. He carried on taking deep breaths and staring at the wall, and then miraculously, they trailed off. For the first time, Max felt like his brain wasn't actually thinking about anything at all. He was just existing. It was an odd sensation, but a good one. He blinked a couple of times, then slowly looked about the room. His gaze settled on the weasel upon its wooden stand. A murmur of anxiety began to bubble up inside him, but he returned to breathing slowly in and out, and little by little, those thoughts slipped away, leaving his mind free once more. This time, the weasel didn't bite him, and when he touched it, Max could feel the energy coursing through him, like before. But the difference was that now it didn't hurt him at all. He was just aware of it. What was even more surprising was that he felt as if he could control where the magical energy went. It could either go back to the way it came into the object or else he could let it seep out in the other direction to diffuse away. Without consciously thinking about it, he let the magic drain away into the air. He hadn't even had to take his shoes off. You did it! Kit had come back and was staring at him, open mouthed. Max blinked, as if coming out of a trance, and the usual jumble of thoughts and feelings flooded back into his mind. I don't know, he said, and he waved his hand in front of the weasel's face. Normally this was its cue to start gnashing its teeth at him, but it stayed completely still. He picked up the stand and examined it, then ran a hand across its fur, though there wasn't a trace of magic left in it. Yeah, he said slowly, I think I did. Chapter 16 Come outside, said Kit. Once had gone over the surprise Max learning how to spell stop. There's someone out there who wants to talk to you. Who? 
a man from the village. I have never spoken to him before, but he says he might know of a way into the castle. Hope shot through Max as he hurried out of the workshop. A man was pacing about the yard. He was quite small with a long black beard that reached to his waist and an enormous cream-colored fisherman's jersey that fell limply to his knees. Max recognized him as one of the customers from Pearl's Cafe the previous afternoon. When he caught sight of Max, he gave a little jump of alarm and quickly scanned the sky as if he was afraid that the keepers would descend on him at any moment. Finding that the coast was clear, he hurried over to them and spoke in a very vast and fast whisper as if he was scared of being overheard. I might know of a way into the castle, but you have to promise not to tell anyone I told you. Do you promise? Yes, of course, said Max at once. When you said that stuff about your granddad yesterday, I nearly spoke up then, but it was too dangerous. She's got spies everywhere. I don't want no trouble. We won't tell anyone, said Kit. The man looked from Max to Kit, then back to Max, and again finally nodded. I've never been in the castle myself, but the story goes that there's an underground tunnel that goes from the cliffs right underneath the cove and leads into the castle. My great-grandfather told me about it. Where's the entrance? asked Max, his excitement rising. There's supposed to be some sort of cave in the cliffs, said the man, tugging nervously at his long beard. I've never gone looking for it. I stay well clear of the castle and the keepers. They give me the coaly wobies. But like Omar said, we all like your granddad and good on you for wanting to rescue him. And if you are a spell stopper, you'll have a better shot at surviving in that place than any of the rest of us. He was looking at Max with something like respect. Max felt a bit peculiar. He wasn't used to people treating him like that. It occurred to him that Bram must have been quite an important figure in the village because of his previous connection with the keepers and keeping the castle under control. That's all I have to tell you, concluded the man as he took another furtive glance at the sky. I'll be off now. Don't want anyone to know I have been here. He hurried away back onwards the village, his jumper flapping about his legs, almost tripping her up. Max watched him go, his early excitement ebbing a little. He had been expecting something more useful, precise instructions perhaps, or an offer to help them break into the castle. Instead, they had just been told a rumor. He turned to Kit, expecting her to be as disappointed as he was, but she was looking completely thunderstruck. What's the matter? Max, I think I know where the entrance to the tunnel is. Where? cried Max in surprise. The shell grotto, of course. Why else would something like that be built in the middle of the cliffs? There is no proper entrance to it. It's completely hidden away. It must be something to do with the castle. Max stared at her. She had a point. If there really was a secret tunnel that led to the castle, that strange cave seemed like the ideal place to conceal it. Let's go there now, he said. We have lots of time already. If there really is a tunnel, we need to find it quickly. Right, said Kit, snapping into action. I'll get together some supplies. You get dressed, you're still in your pajamas. By the time Max returned, fully dressed, Kit was rummaging around the kitchen, lugging a large canvas hold hall that usually lived in the workshop. I think that's everything, she said, tossing in a loaf of bread. What's in there? asked Max, peering curiously at the bulging bag. This and that, said Kit vaguely. It's best to be prepared. The dogs were waiting by the door, clearly keen to come with them. As Max and Kit left, Sardine squeezed out through the door, swiftly following by Banana and Draco. They raced about the yard, happy to be outside. Max felt slightly guilty. Bram always made a point of exercising them twice a day, but Max had been too preoccupied to bring them any further than the farmyard. Let's take them with us, he said, not wanting to waste any more time, trying to coax them back into the kitchen. They need a walk. Kit did not look thrilled by the prospect, but she nodded. Okay, she said. I'll leave my bike here, though. It won't fit through the rocks and someone might notice if I leave it propped against the cliffs. They made their way down to the cove. Max was almost running in his eagerness to get there, the dogs bounding along beside him. Kit was weighed down by her heavy bag, but she steadfastly refused any help. As the cove came into view, Max saw with relief that it was completely deserted. They headed straight for the cliffs, keeping an eye out for any sign of owls. Although Max was looking for the entrance to the grotto, he could not find it. For a moment, he wondered if it had simply vanished like the disappearing castle door. It's here, said Kit, and she dug around what looked like a sheer sheet of rock to where the gap in the cliff was concealed. It was easy to see why no one else in Yowling seemed to know what out about it.
you could walk right past and never know it was there. The dogs did not enjoy going through the narrow slit in the rock face. In fact, they were so upset by the prospect that Max began to seriously regret bringing them. Only Banana, who had always been the most reckless of the trio, could be coaxed into following Kit down the tunnel that led into the cave. Triangle and Sardine simply sat down and refused to budge, so Max had to push them one at a time through the dark, damp route into the cave. The dogs were large and extremely reluctant, and his arms were aching by the time Triangle had finally been shoved down the steep slope to join the others. Max almost fell down after her and collapsed, panting, onto the shell-covered floor of the enormous grotto. His arms across his face to stop the dogs from licking him. I've been thinking, since there is no obvious entrance to a tunnel, there must be some sort of concealed door, said Kit, who was already examining the walls. It makes sense if you are going to take the trouble to put a castle in the middle of the sea, you don't want just anyone to be able to wander in. Max got to his feet and joined her. As he looked around the cave, he realized how monumental their task was. A place was enormous. A hidden entrance could be anywhere. The walls were covered in intricate tunnels that formed a series of arcways. Each one was filled with elaborate floral designs made from countless colored shells. Kip was running her fingers across the flowers, pressing each one in turn, clearly hoping that she would find the catch to a hidden door. Max tried to look for the outline of an entrance or some sort of clue that might take them closer to what they were searching for, but there was nothing to suggest where the tunnel might be. They both walked their way around the perimeter of the cave. The dogs lay down beside the pool watching them. It took hours. Max became more anxious as time dragged on. He could not stop thinking about Bram and what Leandra might be doing to him. I give up, said Kit, sounding tired. This is impossible. Max did not reply, even though he secretly agreed with her. He stepped right back to the edge of the pool and stared around the cave at the swirling floral patterns that reached right up to the high ceiling. They could search for weeks and never find a hidden door. And yet, as he gazed at the walls, he saw that a shape was slowly emerging from some of the flowers. Suddenly, he saw the huge face of an owl staring back at him. It was made from hundreds of glimmering shells set into walls just above their heads, and now that Max had seen, it seemed unbelievable that he had not noticed it before. It seemed to dominate the whole grotto. It seemed sightless eyes pouring into him. Kit, he called and pointed. What? she said, looking at the wall in confusion. The owl there! Kit frowned. Then her eyes widened and she clapped a hand to her mouth. She got to her feet and they both went over to the giant bird's face. It was as if the atmosphere in the grotto had changed now. They had seen it. Before it had seemed strange and wonderful, now it felt threatening and hostile. They looked up at it apprehensively. Max's nerves were on edge. All his instincts were screaming at him to get as far away from this place as possible. But instead he reached up his hand and pressed the sharp beak. It sank inwards with a low rumble into the rock. Max sprang back and Kid gasped as the entire archway gave a shudder. A door swung open. It was made of thick stab of solid stone but seemed to open as easily as if it were on hinges. Max looked into the passage beyond. They had found the tunnel. Chapter 17 Max stepped forwards into the blackness. The tunnel smelled odd. It had the same damp sea salt tang as the grotto but mixed with something else. A putrid reek that reminded Max of rotten meat. He strained his eyes to see, but then a beam of torchlight drove back the dark. I brought one for you too, said Kit, passing him a torch. Max had not realized that Bram owned one torch, let alone two. He felt a wave of gratitude towards Kit. She really was extremely organized, no matter what the situation. Apprehensive about what lay ahead, Max flicked the switch off his torch. It promptly electrocuted him, then broke. Ouch! He cried, dropping it. The torch rolled away, and the dogs, who had followed them through the archway, started sniffing it. Kit shone her torch at him, and he could see the dismay in her eyes. I thought you were okay with electricity now, she said. Max shrugged defensively. I wasn't concentrating. As he spoke, a familiar wave of despair hit him. Ever since he had figured out how to spell stop, he had thought all his problems on that front were over. 
clearly they weren't. It's okay, said Kit, trying to make the best of it. We've still got my torch. The bright yellow beam bounced off the wet black rock as they made their way down a passage that got gradually smaller and smaller the further along they went. It felt very old, as if it had been made many centuries ago, and the ground was rough and covered with rubble that crunched and slid underneath their feet. They had only been walking for a few minutes when the tunnel came to an abrupt stop, blocked by an enormous heap of rocks. Do you know what's where? said Kit, examining the wall. Someone has bricked it up deliberately. You can see from the way the rocks have been piled on top of each other. It was probably Leandra, or one of the keepers before her, suggested Max. I bet they did it to stop anyone getting into the castle. I just hope that we can clear it, said Kit. If we can pull a few out, we should be able to climb through. Max was beginning to feel peculiar. He wasn't sure why. It was all as if all his skin was prickling. It was a bit like the feeling he got when he was about to touch something that had electricity in it. He wondered if it was just the after effects of being shocked by the torch. Meanwhile, Kit had dug her fingers into the edge of one of the stones and was pulling at it. With a loud thunk, it fell out of the wall and landed on the ground. Banana gave a yelp of surprise and trod behind the other two dogs. One down, said Grit fearfully, and Max pulled himself together and stepped forwards to join it. It was grilling work. Each rock seemed to weigh a ton, and they were stacked so closely together that it was difficult to get a good grip on them. It was made harder by the fact that they only had the one torch and they kept having to balance it on its bits of rock so that their hands were free. Soon Max felt the same odd prickling feeling again. Do you feel anything? he asked Kit. Like there's electricity in the air? No, replied Kit, frowning at him. Is something the matter? You look weird. It's nothing, said Max quickly, and he shook his head, trying to get rid of himself of unsettling sensation. They were an eerie dark teller, about to go under the sea. Of course it would feel a bit strange. They had only moved a few more stones when they struck a weak point, and the entire wall tumbled down. Max and Kit sprang aside, pressing themselves against the side of the passage to stay out of the way. When the rocks had settled, there was enough room for them and the dogs to easily climb through. They scrambled over the mound of rubble, then carried on along the tunnel. Soon it began to slope steeply downwards. We must be going under the sea, said Kit. There was barely enough room now for them to walk side by side. Max was getting the prickling feeling again. It was made worse by knowing that they were going underneath the cove, that there was a whole body of water pressing down on top of him. It wasn't just that, though, the stale thin air still felt like it was crackling with energy. If anything, it was getting stronger. He had never encountered anything like it before. In his experience, electricity was always connected to an object or a particular point. This seemed to be all around him. He wondered if the energy could shock him even though he wasn't able to touch it. It seemed unlikely, but he tried his best to stay as calm as possible, as he was about to turn on a light switch or spell stop something. There was no point in taking any risk. Max! whispered Kit, her voice breaking in on his thoughts. She had stopped dead and looked scared. I think there's something coming towards us. Max stopped and listened. There was a funny sort of scuffling, rattling noise echoing through the tunnel. Someone or something was clattering over the uneven floor ahead of them. He scrunched up his eyes, trying to see beyond the thin beam of torchlight into the dark. The sound was getting louder, a dragging, crunching series of thumps. All three dogs started growling. Kit and Max stood frozen, not knowing if they should meet whatever it was head on, or if they should turn and run. The tunnel felt smaller and more stifling than ever. The shuffling noise grew louder. Then out of the darkness came a huge lizard-like creature with thick leathery skin and a blunt nose. It looked like a cross between a dragon and a dinosaur, and it filled up the whole of the tunnel. It had a thick-set body, and its four legs ended in big, sharp claws, which made harsh, scraping noise as it padded forwards across the uneven rock. It paused, blinking in the light for a moment. 
Then it spotted them. It let out a hoarse rattling hiss that echoed eerily around the confined space, and its long forked tongue flicked angrily as it propelled itself towards them. The dogs yelled and fled along the tunnel, and Max and Kit wasted no time in falling close behind. They could hear the creature chasing after them. Even though they were running as fast as they could, it was clear that it was gaining ground. It's no use, gasped Kit. We won't get out in time. She grabbed a rock and hurled it at the creature. It roared furiously, but stopped in its tracks. Max yelled at the top of his voice, hoping to scare it off. The creature hissed back at them and tried to rear up on its hind legs. Its great head stuck the roof of the tunnel and its enormous tail thrashed at the sides, beating the rock with great juddering blows. Max wondered if this was it, if he was going to die. Kit had seized another stone to hurl at the beast, but Max was frozen on the spot. The energy in the tunnel felt as if it was pushing and pulsing through him, mirroring the beating of his own heart. It was the same feeling he got when he was spell-stopping, but it felt bigger and stranger than when he had spell-stopped the stuffed weasel. For a moment, he let the unfamiliar energy swirl around inside him. Feeling it crackle and dance through the body like millions of tiny lightning bolts, and there he let it go. It seemed to seep out of him, slowly draining away to nothing. As soon as his words over, Max could tell that the atmosphere in the tunnel had changed. Even though the huge lizard was still roaring furiously just a couple of meters away, however, this time as it thrashed about, something began to happen. As it struck the roof of the tunnel, a show of stones rattled down and large cracks splintered across the walls. Run, yelled Max. They turned and fled. The dogs had already bolted back along the passage toward the grotto. There was a huge deafening rumble behind them as the roof caved in and the tunnel began to collapse. Rock came raining downwards along with a heap of rubble and sand, swiftly, followed by a huge torrent of water. The good thing was that it created a barrier between them and the enormous lizard but the downside was that the tunnel was now rapidly filling up with sea water. Max was running for his life, but even through his fear, he felt a fierce wave of disappointment. The tunnel, their only way of reaching Bram, was ruined. The water kept surging up towards them, but because of the sharp gradient, they were able to remain above it as long as they did not slow down. Are you okay? Max called, glancing over his shoulder at Kit. Yes, she panted. We've got to keep going. We are not high enough yet. Max was gasping painfully for breath, his heart racing, but he forced himself to carry on running uphill. It felt like the end was almost inside when the passage finally leveled off and they scrambled over the mound of frogs that they had cleared only a short time before. The water seemed to have slowed. They were well above it now, so it was not quite as bad as it could have been when Kit's torch flickered and went out and they were plunged into darkness. We must be nearly there, she panted. Max's lungs were hurting so much that he wasn't able to reply. They carried on along the passage, their hands outstretched like zombies, feeling their way as they stumbled on the uneven ground and groped blindly towards into the black pits. It felt like an eternity, but at last they spotted a small patch of pale grey light up in front of them. It was the arc way back into the shell grotto. They kept going, not daring to relax, until they were out of the tunnel and had heaved the heavy stone door shut. Kit collapsed onto the background, too exhausted to stand any longer. The dogs followed suit, panting heavily. Max sat down next to them, his heart still pounding. For several long minutes, they did not say a word. We are lucky to have got out of there alive, said Kit, eventually, sitting up and clasping her arms around her knees. What was that thing? No idea, replied Max. But there was something strange about that tunnel. I think I might have spell stopped something in there just before the roof caved in. What do you mean? Was it something to do with that monster? I don't think so. It was like, it was something in the air. I can't explain it. I've never come across a place that felt like that before. Kit looked as confused and puzzled as Max felt. It doesn't matter though, does it? Added Max as the awfulness of this situation really began to sink in. The tunnel's destroyed. How are we supposed to get Bram now? I don't know, said Kit. She sounded tired and defeated and had a cut on the side of her face. 
this study now is all keeping a lookout and that's not even including Leandra. No matter how and what we try, they will be expecting us. But we have to do something, said Max. Kid did not answer. Max knew what she was thinking. What if they weren't able to rescue Bram after all? To be continued.